Well, you guys know who I am, but I'm still going to introduce myself anyways. My name is Malcolm Tunnell, and I am a researcher and staff member right here at the Aquatic Nursery. And we're going to be talking about the recent eelgrass removal and dredging that happened at the Cabrillo boat launch. There's a good portion of us here who are from the science realm, so great. But if you maybe need to catch up on some of the terms, don't worry, we're going to explain them as we go. There'll be time for questions at the end, so if you've got them, hold on to them, let them stew, fester, braise, if that's what's going on in your brain. Whatever it might be that's going on, hold those questions to the end and we'll go through it. All right, so just as sort of like the way that I like to think about things, I think especially when we're talking about something like this, which has a lot of different moving parts, we're gonna start from the top and kind of work our way down. And we're gonna start with the literal bird's eye view on all of this. So, first off, we set the scene. Of course, I'm a theater person. I've gotta throw in the theater lingo somehow. So, this is the Port of Los Angeles. So arguably one of the largest and busiest ports in the world. Uh, it covers a total of 7,500 acres. So it's a huge space going all the way up in towards the Wilmington area, all the way down towards the Long Beach area. It's one of the busiest ports in the US. I believe it actually is the busiest port in the US. 16% of all US imports come into the Port of LA which is kind of crazy to think about. That means 16% 16 of literally everything that comes into our country is coming in through the port. And so it serves as a major hub for a lot of different things, uh, from recreation, people going out fishing, watercraft, jet skis, sailing, you name it. Uh, law enforcement also uses the Port of Los Angeles for many different things. If things are getting imported, then you know that there is usually crime that is to be afoot. So on top of that, uh, immigration enforcement also uses the area in case people are trying to come in illegally. That's a whole other topic for another day. We're not gonna get into that right now. But uh, the big thing here is that this is a massive area that's used for a lot of different things. And the crazy thing to think about is that with the Port of Los Angeles being as large as it is, you have to create certain parts of infrastructure to make all this happen. And a big portion of that was the actual creation of the port itself. The port sits on an area that used to be a slough. So for a long portion of time, different rivers and creeks all used to flow into this area here. So this was sort of a brackish area, mostly sort of mud, silt, all of that sort of material. For the port to be built, they had to remove much of that material and go through and create a massive breakwater or break wall there. And the breakwater, by having it created, has created new habitats, it's taken some away, and so it's this strange sort of ecological marvel. And one of the things that it's set up for is this stuff. So this is eelgrass, Zostera marina. It is, in fact, a vascular plant. So unlike most of the plant species or plant-like species that you're probably thinking of, this is an actual vascular plant. It has a root system, it has flowering buds, they're very small, but if you look through a microscope, you can occasionally see them. And what's really cool about eelgrass is that it is a foundation species. So that term gets thrown around a lot when we talk about ecology, but the basic understanding of this is that a foundation species is some sort of organism that is creating the habitat for many other different types of species. And what's cool about eelgrass is that because of having multiple different blades and basically creating a dense space, it can serve as a nursery habitat. So different animals at different life stages can lay their eggs within the eelgrass and their larvae and zooplankton can all find refuge within the eelgrass habitat. And so a thing to point out about eelgrass is that at one point we think that eelgrass was found much in many more places around the United States. Um, of course, as coastal development increases and as we as humans take more and more from our environment, we are removing some of the habitats the, that eelgrass is natively found in. But the weird thing is, is that in creating the Port of Los Angeles, we kind of created the perfect habitat for eelgrass to grow. 
To explain that, I've got this sort of diagram here. So in order to have an optimal eelgrass habitat, we kind of need these three big things all in tandem. We need low amounts of water movement. Eelgrass, while it can survive in areas with high amounts of surge and swell, it doesn't grow all that great. So you need to have low amounts of water movement. On top of that, it needs to be a nice and shallow depth. Because this is a vascular plant, it does need a high amount of sunlight in order to grow and reproduce. So you usually only find it in waters that are about 12 feet deep at its lowest. You can go lower than that in some areas and still find it, but here along the California coastline, 12 feet is usually as deep as you're gonna find it. And then the other big thing is that because this is using a root system, in order for those roots to take hold and in order for it to grow properly, it needs to have a sandy or muddy bottom. So, once again, those three big things that we're looking for here. Low water movement, shallow depth, sandy, muddy bottom. Now the question is, what's a place nearby that we know has all three of these things? If you guess Cabrillo Beach, you're right. So, Cabrillo Beach, lovely, beautiful, filled with algae. Um, it's a man-made beach. So we're gonna be talking about dredging in a moment, but a fun fact around this is that this entire area, the beach itself, didn't exist in the form that it currently does. At one point, when the Port of Los Angeles was being built, the water used to go all the way up to the cliff side. So where we are right now would have still been within water. Kind of a crazy thought to think about. So to create an area for recreation and also to create additional spots for mooring and things like that, uh, they built the beach using all of the sand and debris that they used to create the channels where most of our cargo ships come in now. So much of this sand that is here is still some of the same sand, which has its own sort of set of ramifications that comes with it. But it's kind of perfect because it also means that we have a low amount of water movement due to that breakwater. And on top of that, because of this area, because this is all sand, slow, low water movement is bringing in things like silt and clay. And silt and clay are the big things that make up mud. So this kind of makes it a perfect habitat for eelgrass. So to understand why exactly this all works and why it keeps happening and why we don't lose sand, I want to give you guys a top sort of view here. So we right now, we'll see if my mouse shows up. There we go. So we're right down here. This is Cabrillo Beach right there. And we're right there. So to understand where all of this sediment continues to come from, it's important to look at it like this. So, much of the actual sediment and material that's getting caught within our port is coming in from tidal flow from the oceans. So, slowly but surely as the tide is coming in and out, it's bringing in sediments that are getting trapped. And because of the breakwater here, most of this sediment is instead getting trapped instead of going back out to the ocean. On top of that, we've got the Dominguez Channel coming in from the north. This is, if you've ever been to Ikea, it's the way I like to think about it, you have to go over the Dominguez Channel to get there. Uh, that Dominguez Channel is bringing in fresh water, but it's also bringing on runoff from the entirety of the Los Angeles Basin. So if you can think of things like dust, dirt, pesticides, anything like that that's getting caught is all coming in. And most of the time, those things like silt and clay are getting deposited here within our area. And then the last thing that's important to point out is that land-based runoff still does make its way down. If you've ever been here during a rainstorm, you know that water is rushing down, bringing in all this dust and debris into the port. And so because we have the breakwater there, this is all getting trapped. And it's great if you are eelgrass, but, as we'll see here in a second, it's not great for boats. So this is a, a very comical version of what happens here within the port over a long period of time. So we're gonna have to use our imaginations a little bit. So imagine here, we've got a lovely sailboat here that comes in. Now, right now the base sea floor is nice and low. The boat can easily get in and out 
because there's not as much sediment and sand up close to where it's actually sailing around. But over time, slowly but surely, this sediment, sand, and clay is all building up. Now as the water is coming in, it's bringing this in. Now this isn't something where you're just gonna go out one day and notice, oh my gosh, there's a sandbar in the middle of the channel. This is happening over the span of time of 10, 15, sometimes even 20 years. Now, if you were in an environment where you had a lot of fresh water that's coming in at a certain amount of time, for example, places like the Mississippi River Delta where you're getting a lot of sand and sediment, this is happening over the course of maybe only a couple of years. But here within the port, it tends to be a little bit of a slower process. Now, as you may notice, this small sailboat, it's fine. It can move around as much as it's gonna like because it's not dragging along the bottom. If you're, say, a large fishing trawler though, this isn't gonna work for you. Now, if this is the optimal conditions, if this is a high tide, you're great. At low tide though, once all of that water goes, you are basically sitting high and dry. And that's where the process of dredging comes in. So, to simplify this down, this is just one sort of model. It's actually the model that they use here for our dredging process. Dredging is used uh, primarily to remove the sediment and increase water depth. So as we were saying, this is happening over many, many years. And after a certain point, people start to realize it's getting harder and harder for certain boats to come into areas. So they'll often go and they'll remove the sediment from the area in order to increase waterway navigation. Um, but the big thing here is that when dredging happens, it's sort of indiscriminate. So it's going through and it's taking up sediment and it's removing all benthic habitat that's in that area. So whether that's eelgrass, if you have sandy bottom habitats that are showing up, uh, drift kelp environments happen inside of these areas. All of these are getting removed when you have dredging efforts that are happening. And the other thing is that, especially in places like the Port of Los Angeles, we have a lot of pollutants that end up in our waterways. And eventually, those heavy metals and materials are ending up in our sediments. And when we go and we remove all of that sand, while it does remove some of the contaminants, others of it are going to end up back into the water column. So this sets up a sort of ecological issue and that we are both removing habitat or releasing pollutants and potentially removing individuals and organisms while this is all happening. But it is sort of a necessary evil inside of human operated waterways. We need to have our cargo ships come in to get all of our imports. Uh, if you are law enforcement, if you're using a place like our boat launch, you need to be able to get your large boat in and out in a timely manner. All these things are necessary, but it comes at the cost of the environment. And so that sort of sets up what happened with the Cabrillo Beach boat launch. So if you've ever been down there, you know this is primarily used uh, by a lot of recreational fishermen, kayakers, sailboats, all of that sort of uh, watercraft. But our boat launch is also used by things like uh, the Department of Fish and Wildlife. Uh, it's used by LAPD. It's also used by immigration all at the same time. And because of our location and because we are so close to the opening of the actual breakwater itself, if you're trying to get a boat in and out to sea very quickly, trying to come in at the Carrillo Beach boat launch is kind of your best option. That said, this environment has a very high and very diverse sea uh, eelgrass bed habitat. And so we were sort of left with this question. What happens when you remove all of this well-established eelgrass bed in a fairly short amount of time? So how do we study these sort of things? How do we study the effects of dredging on biodiversity within the boat launch? Now, science is tricky. I think that's kind of like the understatement of the year uh, in that there are a lot of different components that have to come together in order to study these sort of things. And this is a big sort of question. There's no way that I can fully say how is this affecting every single scale and every single aspect of this. But 
we can design a study that's going to be able to be useful and is also to be able to get a small scale idea of what's happening on a larger picture. So to approach this problem, I sort of had uh, these four big criteria for success and four big ways that I could look at framing this project. Oh, and we're going out of order. First off, of course, it had to be low cost. So we are an institution that is funded by the city of Los Angeles. There is only so much of a budget that we have. I am also only one person. I am about to go to grad school. I do not have money. So uh, we had to do something that was going to be low cost. It also had to take a minimal amount of time because as has been said, my first goal is to take care of the nursery and make sure that our animals, algae, whatever it is that we're taking care of is getting taken care of at that time. On top of that, it had to be quantifiable. So we had to be able to find a way to actually put a statistically testable value to all of this. Because I can say and go out there and just say, oh, it looks more biodiverse or it doesn't. Without an actual value, it's really hard to go through and actually understand what's happening. Uh, we also had to use an unbiased metric because it's very easy to just go out and say, you've removed eelgrass, that removes biodiversity. I wanted to find a way that we could basically take in as much of the picture as possible. It had to be easy to repeat because we had to be able to do this in all conditions. We had a very short period of time to get this done. And November and December, historically, I'm saying that with big quotation marks, uh, we've received a lot of rain during November and December. Not so much this year, but we had to be able to use this in all sort of conditions and it had to be able to be done by anybody. Because originally the goal was that not just myself, but others, if we wanted to go out there, could get samples. And we had to do this at the appropriate scale. It had to be small enough that we could actually easily measure this, but also meaningful to the overall question of biodiversity. So when we put all these things together, sort of set up the framework for the larger sort of study that we did. So the scale that we use here, so I'll show you guys the video here, uh, is zooplankton. So plankton, it's super wonderful, super cool. This was recorded here at the nursery. Uh, it forms the basis of many food webs. So just above the primary producers, these are some of our first consumers. So whether you are things as big as something like a whale or things as small as a larval fish, zooplankton are very important in the larger food webs of many different habitats. They also consist of both larval and adult organisms all together. So it gives us a really good idea of the actual health of an overall ecosystem. Uh, and the other thing is that we can easily capture zooplankton. I can't go out there with a net every day and try and capture things like kelpfish or surf perch or crabs, things like that. But I can go out there with something like a plankton net, get the zooplankton, transport them back, and release them in a timely manner. Oh, I guess more video, okay. No? I love you, PowerPoint. Thank you. So, uh, on the easy to repeat, we also had to use something that we already had. And as it turns out, we already have these. This is not our plankton net. I was not a good researcher and did not take photos of my equipment. Um, but we use a plankton net. So basically a very fine mesh net that gets pulled through the water and traps plankton within it. Uh, the one that we were using is right around 50 micrometers, so extremely small stuff. Um, and we pulled it for a defined amount to determine the total individuals sampled across the entire uh, volume that we're pulling. And most importantly, I can stay dry while I pull and collect plankton. Because if you have done research in the water, having to get in to gear, whether it be wetsuits, scuba tanks, otherwise, is not fun, and it takes time. So being able to do a plankton tow, nice and easy. Uh, and then on top of that, to actually go through and count this, we used the microscope. Uh, this was a little bit difficult because we didn't have the time to actually go through 
And in some cases, you can go and basically preserve specimens of zooplankton. That wasn't our goal. This was also being broadcast out in front of our public. And it's very sad to have to explain to the public, oh yes, dead zooplankton. But being able to show zooplankton alive is actually a very good teaching tool. So we grouped them into sort of basic levels. So things like copepods, veliger larvae, noplii, uh, things that were very easy to go and easily categorize without having to go down to a species level. Because this had to be done in a very short period of time. If we had more time, I would have loved to go down to the species level, but time constraints. Uh, we counted three random subsamples from each individual sample um, and then basically used that as an understanding of the sample as a whole. Once again, cutting down on the amount of time. Then we used the counts to create an estimate for the amount of individuals and their proportions to figure out exactly what is going on within this sample. And so to make this quantifiable, math, it's scary, I'm going to explain it. So don't freak out. Uh, this is what we call the Shannon Wiener Diversity Index. There are many different diversity indexes that we could have used. Um, however, I've used this one the most. And the other thing is that the Shannon Wiener Diversity Index uh, takes into account the relative proportions of all individuals and it scales and increases as we have more and more groups possible. So effectively, it's actually showing biodiversity as it scales up. There are other indices that you can use, such as Simpson. Um, those give you a better idea of things like dominance, and that's not really what we were looking for here. So we use Shannon Wiener, and basically all this is saying is that the Shannon Wiener, Shannon -Wiener Index uh, is basically taking the sum of the proportion of any individual level in here, um, as well as the natural log of that proportion of each species. And so you can scale this up as big or as small as you would like. And then we also use this uh, to translate into another metric that I'll talk to you guys about a little bit later, which is called the effective number of species. So essentially you can take this number and then reapply it to get the effective amount of species that you actually have in this cluster, regardless of your proportions. So, and the other thing we wanted to check out, uh, I'm gonna say the results of this were pretty minimal, but I still had to point it out anyways. Um, we tested to just make sure that there were no heavy metals within the actual water samples themselves. We do know that as we remove sediment and dredging, occasionally pollutants are released. So we wanted to check and make sure that those pollutants aren't getting into the water system, they aren't creating too much of an issue. Um, that's the long short of this slide. So the actual cost, when all was said and done, the only thing we actually had to pay for were those uh, heavy metal water test kits. Everything else was all stuff in-house. We used equipment that we had, we made it all work. So when you add on two hours of sampling processing time per day, it's a pretty reasonable study. But what's missing here? So, I have to throw in a meme, because of course I do. Uh, if you are a scientist and you are wondering, where is your control? Don't worry, we're gonna get there. Uh, oceans are dynamic systems, and from November to December, we see a lot of different changes. So just going out and getting samples from one area isn't really gonna give us an idea of if the dredging actually has an effect on the larger situation. So, what about things like the weather? How do we account for other changes that are not related to dredging? That's when we use the salt marsh. So the salt marsh is acting like our control. Now, the salt marsh is a slightly different habitat. There are some different things that come into play, but we do know that it is a very well-established eelgrass habitat, and on top of that, it is close proximity to the boat launch. So we, accept, or we expect that any sort of weather conditions and any sort of phenomena that are happening in this area are also happening there at the boat launch, and vice versa. Uh, and we can also get down to the water. It's very easy for us to drop in a plankton net from the salt marsh and sample through from there. Uh, and once again, these are different environments, but the outcomes are similar. And so the overall goal with this is getting data from the salt marsh to compare against our overall data to see what the actual story is that's happening. 
And then on top of this, we also captured things like tide height, water temperature, cloud cover, solar radiation, and time of day. All things that can also affect what types of plankton that you have in certain areas. So we covered as many bases as we could in this in a very short period of time to actually get some quantifiable data out of this that's usable. So the results, what actually happened here? So just a little bit of a little snapshot of this. Uh, the study was conducted, of course, across from uh, early November to late December, literally the day after Christmas. It was sort of like a late Christmas gift to me to go out and get plankton. It's a fun time. Uh, we captured a total of 55 samples from across the boat launch and the salt marsh. Um, and we were helped out by a couple different people. McKenna is here, so thank you McKenna for coming out and doing one of our toes with us and actually and being an additional chaperone. Uh, Isabella, who's over in education, helped us out as well as Cole. All different people that helped out in getting the actual samples done. So, uh, this is data that was that I was able to get from the Port of Los Angeles itself. So I contacted, reached out to see what sort of environmental impact studies they had done. And what they did was this. So they found that a total of 56% of the eelgrass had been removed from the boat launch. This area that you see on your left hand side is our boat launch. Any of the areas that are red is areas that we have removed, so there are less eelgrass there. Anything that's green is eelgrass that has stayed the same, and yellow is, is, is an increase. So across the board, what we saw, which is pretty self-explanatory, uh, in the dredging process, eelgrass was removed, about 56% of it, which is a pretty big amount. A crossover in the reference area, only about 3% of eelgrass died off during the time period from before the sampling was done and after. So we can say pretty quantifiably that the dredging is the clear result of why we don't have eelgrass. So that's checkbox number one. The good news is that across the sampling, there is no noticeable change in the water quality. So in looking at our heavy metals testing, we notice that there is very little heavy metals that are still sticking around. One thing that is of note in all of this, uh, some of you may have heard about the sewage release that was happening in the Dominguez Channel. Uh, one of the things on our water quality test strips is that you can test for free chlorine. And free chlorine is something that comes through our drinking water system to clean and sterilize our water. Now the only way that free chlorine gets into a water system is when things like wastewater are released back into the overall system as a whole. The water quality test kits actually were able to pick up on those days, and it's kind of cool because later on in a report, uh, they cited the different days, and sure enough, the days that we picked up in here coincide with those days. So kind of cool, not the actual target of the study, but kind of cool nonetheless. Um, so the total numbers of organisms here. So one of the things that we did in our sampling process, we went through and took the amount that we had sampled and scaled that up to an actual number here. So this is individuals per cubic meter when we scale things up. Pre all of this, pre the dredging, we were looking at about 11,608 individuals as our average number that we were sampling. After the dredging, we noticed that it did go down, so around 8,973. However, from a statistical standpoint, this is not significant. In checking through, there is a lot of variability between day to day uh, that's changing all of this. And so, not statistically significant, but it is worth pointing out that the salt marsh did the opposite. So, while the salt marsh increased, the boat launch decreased. Why this happened, I don't fully know. We could be entering into breeding time for certain different species. Any number of different things can happen here in a short period of time. But not statistically significant, not exactly what we were looking at, but data for the good of the order. What we were looking at though was the actual assemblage. So I understand that things are a little bit small here, but this is a snapshot of the average makeup of the different groups that we were sampling. So across our samples, we had things like protozoans, velger larvae, cyprids, 
um, kind of an individ or an in-between stage between going from anoplii to a zoea. So that's just basically as an invertebrate, especially in crabs and shrimp, it's sort of an in-between stage. Platyaminthes, which is just flatworms and things like that. Copepods, they make up the vast majority of the plankton that we find in our samples. Um, we also had things like an other category. This is for anything else that we couldn't quite con quantify. We found a lot of polychaete larvae as well. Uh, the occasional rotifer, uh, like literally one or two rotifers across our entire sample, but they showed up, so they play into the index. Um, but of course, this is sort of like our base snapshot of before. So we can see it's not perfectly balanced, but it is basically dominated by copepods and their noplii. Now, a big portion of the noplii that are made up in all of this are barnacle larvae. And while we didn't have a separate category for it, it's worth pointing out that, of course, we're in an area where we have a lot of areas for them to attach onto, so it makes sense we have a lot of barnacle larvae in the area. And this is what it looks like after the dredging. So kind of crazy. Um, many of the adult or sort of in-between forms of plankton disappear. Uh, and it's instead made up mostly of noplii. And what's interesting about this is that when we compare this across, this means that even though statistically we're not seeing a big change in the amount of individuals, the overall makeup of this habitat is changing. The different types of species that we're seeing are changing. And that's in large effect due to the dredging itself. And then the other thing here is our actual biodiversity indices. So when we take all of our proportions, we put them into our biodiversity index, here is what we come out to. So the Shannon Wiener index, to get an understanding, uh, what we are looking for is higher values. The higher value is, the higher biodiversity is. And that changes as your population becomes more and more diverse. So if you have equal amounts of every individual group, your value is going to be higher. If you have an, oh, hello. Uh, if you have a, a sort of heavily dominated group, it's going to be lower. If it is all of one group, it's going to be zero. And there were a couple of days where we had zeros across this biodiversity study. So if we look at the boat launch, we had about a 1.118, so not great, but also not awful. That drops down to about 0 0.638 after the dredging. And we also have a p-value here, just so you can understand the sort of statistical significance on this. We assigned a 5% or a, a 0 0.05 p-value for this study. So in order for it to be significant, it had to be under this value. Both the salt marsh and the boat launch were both statistically significant, which is interesting to point out. It's very close, but it is still significant. So we represent it. Uh, and we can also see that in the salt marsh, uh, biodiversity is going down as well. Now, where this kind of comes into play, and this is a, a graphic so you can understand, these are box plots. If you have very little working around with it, this is basically a way of understanding where all of our data is falling from a statistical standpoint. So this big black line that you see there in the middle is our mean. Then that big box is our interquartile range. So that's where most of our data is sitting. And then the two sort of larger ends on the end there are the very end ranges of what we would consider normally distributed. Anything outside of that, if we had a couple of dots, we'd have outliers. I am happy to say that we had no outliers for this one, which is Great, I love it. Uh, but just so you guys can see sort of how everything stacked up, this is how it looks from a statistical standpoint. So pre-dredging, you can see that it's a fairly stable habitat. Every day that we're sampling, it looks fairly close to the same. After the dredging, there is a lot of variability across the board. And this is in part due to things like we expect weather change, but we also expect that with that habitat loss, that is also impacting the amount of different species that we have in the area. So the other thing that we did here is assigned our value that we had for our Shannon Wiener index to an effective number of species. 
And basically all you're doing here is you're taking the value from your Shannon Wiener index and you're applying it back uh, into, or into, I believe that's the natural exponent, Euler's number, it's a whole thing. Anyhow, uh, if you go backwards into that process, you can get the effective number of species. And so what we have here is that pre the dredging effort, you have a 3.06. So this means that if we were to go out into a habitat, what we would expect is that effectively, we're pulling from a habitat that has three equally balanced species. That's essentially what we're saying here. As we go through and the dredging happens, that number drops down to about 1.89. Now, in a larger sort of situation where we were having things like hundreds of different species, we wouldn't use a decimal. But in this case, since we're using such a small scale, using the decimals here is extremely important in understanding what's actually happening. So this is about a 38.2% a decrease. And the salt marsh we see a very similar sort of decrease, but to a much smaller scale. So about a 22.6% decrease. So that's what's happening across the board here. So we can confirm through the study that yes, biodiversity is being impacted across the board. And like we were talking about with our controls, when we went back through and correlated the data to see if there were any other sort of patterns that were showing up, uh, there were none that were statistically significant. So in checking our tide height, solar radiation, so the amount of sunlight that's actually reaching the surface, um, cloud cover, time of year and time of day, uh, and water temperature, no difference, no correlation. So what we can say here, even though this is a pretty small sample, you can still say that the main factor that's driving our drop in biodiversity is our dredging efforts that occurred. So why does this matter? I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna play this video as I talk about this, because this is kind of cool to point out. So this is sort of a snapshot. Um, over on the right hand side, you can barely make it out. That is the edge of an eelgrass blade. And on this eelgrass blade, these are diatoms and other algae that are growing onto that eelgrass blade. And as you can see as well, things that are growing around it, we've got a copepod sort of going through. We've also got some sort of protozoan or other animal that is on the algae. You can notice, if you look there, it's actually pulling through and is filtering the water. You've got diatoms in the background, lots of different species all here within this habitat. This all matters because at this scale, if you look at it, if we take away the eelgrass beds, we're removing all of this. We're removing microhabitats and animals that live on these eelgrass beds as they go. So we're not just losing one habitat when we take this. We're taking countless microhabitats that only are found in some cases within these geographic loca locations. Oh, yes, PowerPoint, thank you. Yes, no, okay, we're skipping. Thank you. So the other thing that this is important to understand is this idea of trophic cascade. So when we remove the zooplankton, this is also changing the entirety of our larger food web. When we remove eelgrass beds, we are also losing the zooplankton that live in and around these zooplankton beds. If they aren't immediately killed off, they're in some cases displaced, they move to other habitats. When we lose the zooplankton, there's not enough food for larger organisms. Whether that is things like larval fish, if that is other filter feeders, whatever that might be, these other organisms then can't eat because they don't have the food they need. And even if we think about this as there's a change in the proportions, as you know, if you work in the nursery, Things have different mouth sizes. So not everything is eating the same amount or the same kinds of species. When we remove eelgrass beds and we're essentially removing that biodiversity, we could be killing off the type of zooplankton that is needed by that species in order to survive. When we lose the food for these larger organisms, these larger organisms will no longer be found in these areas. And 
Of course, after that, the top predators then start to die off or they leave the area. And when you lose top predators, that's where things get kind of crazy. Things can go absolutely haywire. If we think about examples like Monterey, if you remove something like a sea otter, sea otters control the urchins. The urchins are eating the kelp forest beds. You lose kelp forests, it all continues to cycle. So trophic cascade can happen with things like this. And that's why it's so important that we look at biodiversity on this scale. On top of that, so this is from Fiji. This is not inside of the port of Los Angeles. I guess it's designed to play audio too. Um, we can use the same sort of ideas that we apply to this study into larger situations and much more complex ecosystems like these coral reef habitats. Because when we scale up, all of these animals are playing the same sort of roles that our plankton are playing at smaller scale. Whether it's the coral that's playing a foundation species, any of the different small fish that are playing in as food to the larger sort of individuals that you see, the larger sort of petrali and animals that you see around this habitat, they're all using these same sort of things. And by using small scale examples, like using zooplankton in a very small little portion of a larger port of Los Angeles, we can understand what the effects might be on a larger, more fragile ecosystem. Now, there is some study about trying to put down an actual number and quantify these things as it goes, but just think about this from the, spe the space of a coral reef. What happens? when you remove 56% of a coral reef habitat. What happens there on a larger scale? It's happening right now with the Great Barrier Reef. We are losing large portions of these habitats and they are creating crazy trophic cascades across all different habitats. And they're affecting us as well. We remove coral reefs. When we remove things like this, it's removing our natural barriers for things like storms. When storms come through, they damage houses, we lose lives, and then in the aftermath of that, things like diseases are able to grow. This becomes a much larger situation, but it all comes back down to the same core thing. When we remove habitats and we remove biodiversity, this affects all of us at whatever level we are looking at it. Once again, PowerPoint doesn't want to move on. And at the same time, it's important that we find balance. We understand that we are living in a world where we are using our oceans, we're using the port much more than ever. As we all know, as from things that have happened, when you cut off things within our port, they have larger effects for not only our country, but the world as whole. The supply chain issues, many of them start with issues that were happening here within our port. And those issues can happen again if we don't go and remove sediments. But at the same time, we have to be able to remove these sediments in ways that are not affecting these habitats that are crucial to the overall biodiversity of our larger habitat. What is the balance? I don't know. I think there are many people that are still trying to figure that out to this day. But the important thing here is understanding that we all kind of have a push and pull in this sort of larger environmental scale. We all need the port, but we also need these habitats. How do we work together? We do more things like small scale studies. We understand these situations as they come up and look at the effects as they're happening. And we do exactly what I'm doing here. We take the science that we learn and we share it back to the people who need it most. Whether you are a scientist, whether you are working in the nursery, even if you think of yourself just as a human being. By knowing that these things are happening at this scale, in a place that is right outside of our backyard, we gain a sense of stewardship for our environment. And so simple studies like this can end up having a larger effect in communities, both from a biological standpoint and from a human standpoint. And it's really important that we remember that no matter how big or small these studies are, they all play a part in the understanding of working with our environment and creating balance within the larger planet that we all inhabit. We only have one planet Earth, and so we have to work and live with it in a way that is responsible for all parties involved.
And so the last thing I want to leave you guys with is this quote. It feels sort of cheesy, but this is actually a quote that I keep kind of close to my heart. It said, the future is in the hands of those who explore. And from all the beauty they discover while crossing perpetually receding frontiers, they develop for nature and for humankind an infinite love. So Jacques Cousseau quote. The guy is great at quotes. But it's a great quote to take with you. Because if we don't explore, we will never understand how our world works and how our small impact, whether it be right here or whether it be on a global scale, how that affects our world as a whole. So it's important that whether or not you have a lot of money, whether or not you have a lot of resources, whether or not you have a lot of time, and whether or not you have a lot of access, scientific studies like this are important. And no matter what it is that you do, keep exploring. Because exploration is the key to understanding our world and creating balance within our larger planet. So I'll end this by saying thank you to Jose for one, green lighting this, the aquatic nursery team for allowing me to do this and sometime taking a little bit more time than I would like. Uh, Fong and Cat Prickett, who are over in the port of LA, they were a great resource throughout all this and all of you guys for attending. So thank you guys so much. And at this point, I want to open it up to questions. So, uh, we looked at turbidity. Uh, however, one thing that we found out, our sensor was designed for fresh water and not for salt water. So that threw off our values. But on top of that, finding turbidity sensors and things like that, um, a little bit more expensive. We did consider it, but also in looking at the research, um, there were a couple of studies that were done here within the port, and what it finds is that after a dredging happens, usually that plume that's created and that turbidity ends up subsiding after about 72-ish hours. And that's within our system at least. So in the time that we were able to get back to the boat launch, more than 72 hours had passed, so we couldn't actively test the turbidity at that point. So we got left out of the larger research. It's a wonderful question, though. Thank you. Yes? How, how deep did they dredge when they dredged? Yeah, so uh, it showed in one, of the, uh, in one of the images. But the outside area right next to the dock originally was about six feet. They went through and removed about five feet of sediment from the boat launch area. So it now sits right at around 11 to 12 feet deep. So they so. could potentially like replant some eelgrass after they dredge. Yeah, they very easily could replant eelgrass. And if you're not going through and doing more dredging efforts, the eelgrass will grow back very slowly, of course. It is a plant. Um, but it is one of those things where that's an additional effort that I think they would have to put on. I don't think it was something they were considering. Simply the idea that the eelgrass will grow back. We'll just sort of let it go. Do I think that reconstruction and things like that do need to happen? Yes. But in this study, I wasn't able to get that data. So sort of left that to the side. Thank you. Yes? First of all, awesome presentation. Thank you. You're going to get the other thing there. That's cool. Um, I have a question and a comment. Yes. First, can you describe the difference between species richness and the effect of species that you calculated? Yeah. yeah. So species richness uh, is simply, in this case, or in a larger ecological sense, it's simply the amount of species that we had in the environment when we sample. The effective number of species is basically saying the amount of species that we have that is completely balanced. So if we were to go out into an environment, we would expect from an environment like this where we're getting these results, you'd have three effectively balanced species. Cool. And common. So yes. with the Shannon Weiner and Femme disease and like the Simpson and disease, when they were, when, so I think there's a lot more actually um, intense results that you're leaving on with your with your numbers. So a lot of the your your numbers with your your Shannon Winers were like one to like zero point something, which actually is not really that diverse in the mm -hmm. Shannon world. 
right? It's like 0 to 4.6, right? Like 4.6 is like super diverse, like rainforest diversity or coral reef diversity. When she made that the diversity index, it was meant for species specifically. Mm -hmm. So you could use it for larger groups like you did, but the resolution drops down, right? Indeed. So, yeah, so when you look at your numbers, you see one, it's like, oh, it's not that diverse, but you have like larger taxonomic groups, mm -hmm. and you're still finding these big differences between pre and post regimen. So if you actually went in and got down to the species level, there would be even that much more magnification of your results, which is like super, super cool. Exactly. And it, it just shows like, you know, if we wanted to continue doing these and getting more specific on species, like it's like that much more intense and magnified, which is awesome. Yeah, and in some cases, there were certain species that we, after going through, figured out we can identify which this species is. But because we couldn't do that at each different level, yep. we wanted to make sure that I could just basically put it into the basic group. So without sort of biasing the spectrum towards one individual, whether that be a genus or a phylum, whatever that might be. So, yeah, usually when people do those types of broad categories, they don't really find that much stuff or difference yeah. in, in using the disease. So it's, it's crazy that you did, and it just shows how intense this drug looks like. Yes. Again, yeah, you're an incredible speaker. Thank you for today. Thank um, you. Um, when you spoke to Bob and Kat at Port of LA, yeah. what was their reaction, and did you discuss, has anyone ever done anything like this? So, I had to be a little bit sneaky. Um, <laughs> uh, my big thing is that uh, I didn't want to go in and put them on the defensive. So, my other background is in working with people. And I know that if you go into a conversation directly accusing people, all of a sudden their defenses go up. So, uh, I communicated with Paul. Uh, and explain what I was doing looking at zooplankton biodiversity and I laid in the effect that we were doing a study before the dredging happened. We are trying to see what effect the dredging may have had on this environment. Uh, is there any way that you can provide us any publicly available data? And they actually went a step above and the report that I got is an internal document uh, it is not a document that we'll see like public distribution. Um, and it actually goes pretty well into detail down to like a, a level of them counting the individual blades and the density of the eelgrass, uh, which is really cool. Uh, but they were really open and receptive. And I went to Fong first. Uh, Fong was sort of overseeing the larger project. And then Kat actually works in the environmental department within the Port of Los Angeles. So it was sort of like a chain up, and then she handed over the document. So they were super awesome, very flexible. I was able to get this all done. I thought it was going to take days. It took an hour from the first call to getting the actual document. So Port of LA, wonderful in this case. I cannot say for every single instance. But they clearly have the data. And if you ask nicely, they're willing to share it. Any other questions, comments, thoughts? Okay. Oh, what the what? One fire. Were you able to look at any of the consumers uh, if they were disrupted at, during the sort of process that would have affected any of your numbers? For example, like fish or, or other birds that would have consumed? No, so I would have loved to. In a perfect world, I would love to look at this from multiple different levels. So you can see how is one possibly affecting the other, uh, possibly create a little bit more of a correlate, or correlation across the board. Uh, but we weren't able to go through and actually look at consumers. Occasionally we would get a large, what we would call it a large mobile organism within our plankton toes, whether that was grunion larvae, uh, we got a couple of like larger, um, larger sort of parasitic copepods and things like that that we would find occasionally in our sample. However, um, even at that point, we couldn't get enough data because it was sporadic. So you may find 
For example, we were finding a phyra at certain points. Um, we found a phyra, larvae, it was all across the board. And without going down to the species level and figuring out what the exact diet is of each individual, it's hard to get a very good idea of what's happening. So in a perfect world, I would love to do like a full, like ground up, look and see what's happening at every different level. But with the time constraints and the resource level, we weren't able to do that. Was that the final question? Okay, thank you guys so much.